last week we began a new uh, series of lessons in our Sunday discussion meetings and we heard something that unlike other faith traditions around the world, the Christian religion is not about a way of life. And that concept rather startled me a little bit because I always think that there is a way of life. And you know, there are songs that they will know we are Christian by our love. And uh, I was rather startled by that concept because it said rather than being a way of life, it is about a belief system and a belief in a man a belief in Jesus Christ, in who he was, what he was, and what he said. But I want to talk this morning a little bit about if we follow certain principles as a Christian way of life, that we can indeed have joy and peace and serenity and a good life as a result of following those particular principles. Now, I don't mean to say that I adhere to the prosperity gospel. That is the gospel that says, if you just only believe in Jesus, you'll get all kinds of wealth. I don't believe that. It may come, but I don't believe that that's the reason we believe in Jesus. But I do believe there are things that we can do and we, ways we can live by Christian principles that will provide for a far better life. I use an analogy sometimes to some people that uh, uh, how I got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. When you come in to AA, they say, don't drink. It's the first thing they tell you. Don't drink. Well, I'm there because I've been drinking too darn much. And they're telling me, don't drink. Read the book book, go to meetings, bring God into my life. And I told them, I said, you know, you're nuts. If I could not not drink, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> so a member told me, he said, I'll tell you what. He said, if you come in, you go to meetings, you read our book, you do our steps, you bring God into your life, you won't drink. You see, the actions precede the results. I had to do something in order for the results to happen. And the same thing, I believe, is true about leaving, living a Christian life. I believe that there are certain principles that I can live by and do that will produce certain results in my life. Now does that mean that I have a God that will tell me if you just do this and if you just be a good boy I will give you grace and love? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean that I have to do things to earn God's love because I cannot. It simply means to me that if I, uh, I do certain things, good stuff will happen. In fact, I used to have a bumper sticker on my, uh, that I had for years. I got in marriage in Richmond. And it just said, good stuff happens. That was my rebellion to another popular bumper sticker in those days about <laughs> blank happens. <Yeah. laughs> and you see, today, I expect good things to happen in my life. And it's because I put myself in a position so that good things will happen rather than putting myself in a position where bad stuff happens. The first week of this month, we discussed how necessary it is to have unity with in our church and a unity of action that we work all together as a family of God. 
And then the next Sunday, we talked about how necessary it is to forgive one another. But we talked about it from the point of view that it's necessary to forgive one another to benefit the one doing the forgiving, not the one who has been forgiven. And so today we're talking about how good it is, how necessary it is, and the results that, uh, that are good that can happen in our lives by following certain Christian principles. And I am not talking about monetary benefits that might come as a result of that. That might be, but I distinguish it from that uh, uh, gospel, the prosperity gospel. And I think that we can agree that it doesn't do us any good at all to live a virtuous life out of fear. I don't believe it does us any good, as I've said in recent sermons, to come to church out of fear. If we're here out of fear, we're, we've missed the whole point. The truth of the matter is, in life, we look around and we see what's around us, and we see that a moral life truly is the best way to live. It works best for me, and it works best for those that I love. And Jesus talks about what I call doing the next right thing. And that's why I titled this sermon, Doing the Next Right Thing. If we continue in our life to do the next right thing, good stuff literally will happen in our life. Jesus says in Matthew, the fifth chapter, 14th verse, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. You see, people should be attracted to that light within you and within me. We have ways of expressing that light in our life or ways of showing people that the light is not burning very brightly. Whether we like it or not, people see us in our daily activities, whether it be at work, whether it be at the grocery store, whether it be at church, or in our social groups or whatever. They see us and they make value judgments. And for the most part, they know that we profess to believe in Christianity. And it's how we respond to the ups and downs that gives them their ideas about what it is like to live a Christian life. See, children are not the only ones that watch, that see, and they follow. Children, yes, they do imitate us, but so do adults. And the question for us really is, are our responses any different from those from anybody who, prof who does not to profess to know God? <coughs> not only are non-Christians looking at us, but so are other Christians looking at us as well. And persons who are new to the faith often look at us and they sometimes take their lead from more mature Christians who follow the Christian principles. <coughs> so it's a matter of being sure that we live by those principles in order to encourage others that they will follow this way of life. And once we do that, and we continue to do that, we automatically become more productive and more successful in the rest of our life. There was a church's young men's softball team that was in a hard-fought game with one of their regular rivals that they had played for several years. And these games 
were usually very well played and they were exciting because they were rival churches and they had a lot of fun, but they were very competitive. And there was one player up at bat and he had a screaming line drive out in the center field and it was really a good hit. And he got to first base and he decided to try to make it to second. He turned the corner and ran to second. Well, the center fielder made an excellent throw and he was out at second base. Well, the boy that was out was very upset with the umpire. And he began shouting and hollering at the umpire. And his teammates were even trying to encourage him to get off the field. And he, he kept shouting and his language became coarse and became very abusive. And the coach finally got him off the field. And he said, son, don't you know that people are looking at you? And don't you think they're looking at you as who do you represent as a young Christian man? Is that the way people, you want people to look at you and see how you live your life with that kind of language and that kind of action? And it brings the question, how do we practice what we preach? Well, for the most part, it's a matter of discipline, and repeating those good practices over and over again until they become natural. <coughs> we practice what we preach when our lives become reflections of Jesus Christ. The way we act at work, the way we act in the grocery store, the way we act anywhere else at home, ought to be the same. And when people see us and see us as being a reflection of Christ, then they too will be motivated to live a better life. So much of being a Christian and having a life of joy and serenity is found in how you and I truly practice what we preach. Some call this a walking the walk that we talk. I saw a Peanuts cartoon some time ago. It was a strip that showed Peanuts, or Snoopy, the dog up on top of a roof. <laughs> and he had a bunch of little baby birds there. And it was time for them to learn to fly. And Snoopy was going to be their teacher. And so he walked to the edge of the doghouse and he started flapping his ears. And then he took off. <laughs> and he came crashing down on his head. The next scene he got up, he got on the roof, and he says, now you see, the lesson is that you're supposed to do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> And another way by which we can judge whether we live by Christian principles <coughs> and look at the success of our faith is to know whether our faith is centered on success or if it's centered on service. If our faith is centered on success, it is very likely not to be a real deep-seated faith. Jesus talks about that this morning in the lesson we read. He says, they love to have the place of honor at banquets and best seats in the synagogues and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have all the people call them rabbi. <coughs> it was a practice then of the pious Jews to wear headbands and they wore stoles. Uh, but these men that Jesus was talking about wore great big headbands and they wanted to sit in the best spot and be noticed and called rabbi uh, like many people today, both inside and outside the church. These men were more interested in success than they were in service. Dr. James Moore was invited to participate in a 
career day at a campus in a college in Southwest Texas somewhere, and he was asked to be part of a panel discussion. And the panelists were asked to discuss how faith influences your choice of career. Well, first the panelists were asked to uh, introduce themselves, and then they were to mention their particular vocations. And it was all pretty routine, humdrum presentation. One woman got up, gave her name, and said, I'm an attorney. A man got up, gave his name, he said, I'm in business. I own a computer company. A woman gave her name, and she said, well, I'm uh, in real estate. And when it was Dr. Moore's turn, he got up and just simply said, I'm a minister. The next person who was seated next to him was a doctor. The doctor's statement changed that mundane situation into a special and sacred moment. He addressed the students, and he said, we're here today to talk about vocation. He then told them the meaning of the word vocation, and they, that means calling. And he said, well, my calling is to be a Christian. One of the ways to do it is through the practice of medicine. See, my calling is to be a Christian. One of the ways to do it is to live by Christian principles. The doctor wasn't being pompous. He wasn't being arrogant. He was just simply a humble man who had a strong sense of his partnership with God. His life was a success, but his first priority was serving, serving God's children. All who exalt themselves will be humbled. And all who humble themselves will be exalted. How do you tell sincere faith? Ask yourself, do you practice what you preach? Do you expect others to stand up to standards that you yourself don't reach? Is your faith centered in success? Or is it centered in service? What can I do, Lord, today? If you do these things, and do as Jesus tells us to do, we live a life of faith. And a life of faith is guaranteed to always see us through. And you don't do these things in order to get what you want. You don't do them in order to earn favor with God. Someone has said, repetition confirms and strengthens. And then faith comes naturally. It is quite certain that repetition of the suggestions of Jesus on how to live a Christian life will confirm and strengthen a life of service, a life of joy, a life of serenity. Try it. It always works. It is a formula. It's a formula for doing the next right thing.